On May the 28th, Nevada received two pieces of disappointing news from the Department of Energy involving high-level nuclear waste. The first was a decision that Yucca Mountain is definitely in the running for the first high-level waste repository. The second is that whatever state ends up with the first repository may end up with the only repository. The President's decision to choose Nevada as a possible site for the first nuclear waste dump did not come as a surprise, although none of us are very happy about it. However, the Department's decision to indefinitely postpone the second repository did come as a real su surprise and has led a number of Nevadans to wonder why the Department proposes to take this seemingly inexplicable action. As long as the people of Nevada were confident that they would never be asked to bear the entire national burden for high-level waste, they were reluctantly, reluctantly willing to participate in the site selection process in good faith. But now the people of Nevada wonder whether the federal government has been completely open with them, upfront with what its plans and intentions really are. The old call for a sagebrush rebellion can once again be heard triggered by the feeling that big government in Washington is not to be trusted. I sincerely hope that I will hear something today that will allow me to reassure the people of Nevada that they have not been taken for granted by the Department of Energy, that they should continue to have faith in the Department's devotion to the law, and that their rights will not be violated by the Washington bureaucracy. Specifically, I'd like to hear that there will be a second repository I'd like to hear that work on that repository will be completed on the schedule mandated by law until and unless the Congress amends the law. And I would like to hear that Nevada will be given freely and without stalling or hesitation the federal funds to do independent research in connection with the possible site at Yucca Mountain for the first repository. I must advise my colleagues as well as the department that if I am not reassured on these matters as a result of today's hearings, I am prepared to follow through with the appropriate remedies available to me, including legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Heck. Uh, Senator Laxall, would you uh, proceed? <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator Evans, excuse me. I, I thought maybe that since Did we you had- Did you get by me? That's yeah, I thought I was gonna get by you, <laughs> but I really don't, don't mind not getting by you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, it's, uh, I can understand the willingness to get by me because I've been very quiet on this issue, even though our state is one of the three and have been, uh, I think, most accommodating to the Department of Energy and to others, believing that we ought to conduct this uh, entire matter on a scientific basis and, and find out what's best for the country. And if what's best for the country includes the state of Washington, so be it. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've changed my mind. And let me just uh, read very briefly excerpts and would ask that my entire uh, opening statement be included in the record. As a senator from one of the three states nominated for consideration as the site for the first deep geologic repository, I have a keen interest in the Department's activities with relation to high-level waste. I was not a member of the Senate when the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 was crafted, but I've become distinctly aware of the extremely delicate and complicated nature of this legislation. The act represents the outcome of intense technical and political pressures. It would not have passed if all of the elements that are in the act were not in the act. Instead, it appears that the Department of Energy has made a unilateral decision to abrogate its responsibility under the law, choosing to discontinue site-specific research, which will ultimately result in the failure to nominate sites for a second repository as required, as required under Section 112 of the Act. This unfortunate and ill-timed move by DOE does not simply impact the second repository program, but threatens the integrity of the whole nuclear waste disposal plan. The NWPA was crafted with the clear intent of providing for two repositories. For the citizens of the states under consideration for the first repository, these plans for a second repository made it clear that the, that the waste disposal program was truly a national solution to the waste problem and that their states would not become the sole dumping grounds for all of our nation's high-level waste. This careful balance has now been disrupted. 
Mr. Chairman, I think it is clear that if we do not bring the repository program back on track and restore public confidence, we will face an ever-increasing number of lawsuits and delays, greatly increasing costs to the government and ratepayers, and leading to an unraveling of the carefully constructed disposal schedule. Mr. Chairman, in my view, the DOE has brutally mangled the act it is obliged to follow. Unless the Department can quickly redevelop confidence in its management of the program and accurately follow the law, then I believe, Mr. Chairman, new leaders ought to be chosen. New leaders. Thank you very much. Uh, well, obviously, we all know where you stand. <laughs> Could I have a copy of that so I can understand? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, I don't think I've intentionally or otherwise skipped anyone, have I? Senator Laxalt. I thank you, the Chairman, members of the committee. First of all, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, Senator Heck, and Senator Evans as well. They reflect generally how I feel. I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, Senator Benson. Senator Gorton, I guess this table could be appropriately called the victim's table. <laughs> You may not be, Senator Warner. Thank you. Senator Warner, he said they were the, that was the victim's table, in case you didn't hear that. The decision to drop plans for a second repository is but the latest in a long line of actions that indicate the DOE's willingness to ignore the spirit, if not the letter of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. This high-handed disregard of the express statutory mandate calls into question the validity of site selection activities carried out thus far. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act intended that site selection decisions be made after careful scientific evaluation and in consultation with affected states and Indian tribes. And that was the intent from the very beginning. This is not to be a solo trip on the part of DOE. They were supposed to be in consultation with the various states who were involved in the site selection process, and the tribes as well. This impartial, deliberate, technically conservative process is essential to promote public confidence in the outcome. Senator Hecht alluded to that. And in this highly sensitive, emotional area, public confidence is absolutely essential to the integrity of this process. Yet, despite the requirement for state consultation, the DOE has repeatedly ignored the legitimate efforts of affected states to participate, and mine is one of them and we're deeply resentful of that. Despite the gravity of this undertaking, the DOE has taken every opportunity to shortcut the site selection process. The desire to meet deadlines has preempted concerns of public confidence and safety. By way of illustration, the DOE has stonewalled Nevada in its efforts to secure funding for pre-site characterization studies. Perfectly reasonable request contemplated by the Act. Even though the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in our favor last December, we had to go to court to get what we thought we had anyhow within the framework of this act. The DOE has refused to heed a GAO warning and recommend more than three sites for characterization, despite the consequences for the program if no site is found suitable after site characterization. In short, the DOE has flaunted its authority over both the legislative and judicial branches of government. Now, these actions have been particularly frustrating for Nevadans, since statements by DOE officials have been interpreted by some in our state to mean that the Yucca Mountain site is first on the list. There's been too much idle speculation about that as well. The citizens of Nevada have always believed strongly in contributing their fair share toward the betterment of this nation. And we've attempted to be good soldiers, and I think we have been. We will not, however, allow the federal government to pose upon us a process that is not clearly defined as potentially unfair. We will not permit the DOE to railroad a nuclear dump into Nevada, and that's essentially what we feel is happening here. Since DOE has frustrated us on every front and repeatedly ignored our legitimate concerns, we've been forced to initiate action on two fronts. First, we, filled, uh, we have filed, in conjunction with the governor and some of our other officials, five lawsuits in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. These lawsuits seek to invalidate the recent recommendation of sites for characterization on the grounds that the process has been flawed, and we feel deeply that it has been. In addition, we will introduce today the companion to H.R. 
5031, Congressman Vukanovich's bill to repeal sections 112 and 113 of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. The bill will require the Secretary of Energy to suspend site selection and characterization activities until the Congress issues new guidelines, and we need them, and we need them badly. We simply cannot allow a bad process to continue unchallenged. Now, I recognize the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is a result of long deliberations and compromise among many interests. Senator Evans alluded to that, and it was. That was a tough bill here, and it had to reconcile the technical with the political aspects. It established a process intended to lead to the selection of the best geologic site. That's what the game was about. It attempted to balance the interests of individual states and the nation as a whole. But in practice, the act has proved to be ambiguous. The DOE has fully exploited these ambiguities to speed up the process at any cost. Even where the act is clear, the DOE has refused to follow its dictates. I believe the resulting damage to public confidence can never be repaired. In my opinion, it is now simply politically impossible for high-level nuclear waste ever to be stored in bulk in the continental United States. Therefore, it's time, I think, for us to reopen the debate. We can no longer accept as a premise the solution devised by Congress in 1982. We in government have a duty to be absolutely certain that we are utilizing the best, safest means of disposing of this waste. Until we have carefully studied every possible alternative, we cannot know this. And history is replete with example of those who made important decisions with incomplete information. The recent nuclear disaster at Chernobyl reminds us that these responsibilities are international and cannot be undertaken in isolation. If nothing else, Chernobyl proved that these burdens of the nuclear age are no respecter of man-made boundaries. Decisions involving nuclear materials may have an impact far beyond the borders of any one state. If Canada were to have an accident, with the disposal of its high-level nuclear waste, the United States could certainly suffer as well. And whatever efforts we have made to dispose of our own waste safely would not make much difference. We must join, it seems to me, with other nations to set the highest standards for safety in the operation of nuclear power plants and disposal of high-level nuclear waste. We must pool our scientific and economic resources to thoroughly explore alternatives to geologic disposal. A number of experts believe that deep sea burial is technologically feasible. I understand statements were made by some of the DOE of, uh, officials to that effect to the House Committee several days ago. And while exploration of the ocean floor may take more time and cost more money, these considerations pale in light of the potential for irreparable harm. We cannot follow the path of least expense and least resistance. We owe it to ourselves and to future generations to take the time and spend the money to do it right. We cannot overlook any possible answer to a problem this crucial, for we will never have the chance to correct our mistake. I thank the members of the committee.